listening to the Shared Security Podcast with Tom Esten and Scott Wright, exploring the trust you put in people, apps, and technology. Silent Pocket is a proud sponsor of the Shared Security Podcast. Silent Pocket offers a patented Faraday cage product line of phone cases, wallets, and bags that can block all wireless signals, which will make your devices instantly untrackable, unhackable, and undetectable. Use discount code Shared Security to receive 15% off your order. Visit silent-pocket.com to take advantage of this exclusive offer. Well, welcome everybody to episode 85 of the Shared Security Podcast. Hello. <laughs> this is this is all new for us. So um, this is unscripted. Can you believe it, Scott? Unscripted. I can't believe it. <laughs> it's all good. It'll be fun. So um, I think we're yeah. uh, going to just go right into our episode and... Um, if, if anybody is in the chat or is joining the chat, feel free to comment and say hi. We will, we will say hi back. We've got our little chat window up. Um, you have anything else, Scott, before we kick no, things I off? No, I think uh, we're good. This is going to be a very exciting uh, <laughs> episode. There could be many technical glitches, but uh, we're just going to yes. wing it and we're going to uh, beg people's forgiveness, as they say. Right, uh, but we have, right. uh, I think, some some good topics today, and I think it's going to be uh, uh, hopefully a, a good way for us to do our uh, podcast in the future. So let's get started. Yeah, I agree. So, well, welcome to episode eighty-five, Scott. How are you? Thanks, Tom. I'm great, <laughs> and welcome <laughs> to you too, and everyone else. Uh, I, I see we have hundreds of listeners. Oh, 200, 300. There we go. Uh, so we're way up. <laughs> <laughs> Good way to inflate Shut the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Uh, well, nobody's going to check. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> no, it's 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 good. We're going to have even more fun than we usually do on our uh, closed circuit uh, recordings. Now it's all live and it's just hanging out there. So, that's right. It's an ugly that's right. image, but anyway, uh, let's let's get started. Why don't we talk about what we're going to talk about? Some do some meta right now. Yeah, let's do that. So. Um, you know, first I wanted to just thank our sponsors, uh, Silent Pocket and Edgewise Networks for continuing to support the show. So greatly appreciated. So make sure you check out Silent Pocket, silent-pocket.com. Uh, we also have a discount code if you're interested in purchasing any Silent Pocket products, which we highly recommend. And that discount code is shared security, and that will give you 15% off your order. Awesome. So uh, yeah, I mean that that's been really nice to have uh, have some sponsors, and uh, we we do appreciate having them. Absolutely, and as you can see, we are trying the live streaming. So uh, so far, so good. Um, there's a little story to this, Scott, that you may not be aware of. <laughs> Would you like oh, to you hear don't. it? <laughs> so I I set up this first link or the first stream just using kind of the YouTube defaults. And I had switched it from uh, Google Hangouts to, I guess, the real way that you're supposed to stream with software and actually come up with, you know, a fancy background. And, you know, we could have like crazy things in the, you know, in the back while Scott and I are talking. And, you know, it's what, you know, real streamers use. Like the yeah, stream they make Fortnite it look effortless. And stuff. Right? Yeah, they do. And um, well, I realized yesterday that uh, that wasn't going to work because um, I didn't have any of the streaming software set up. So I went in and I tried to test everything. I'm like, why isn't anything working? And I realized, okay, I got to set up all this software. And I'm like, I don't got time for that. So <laughs> uh, I killed off the old link and then uh -oh. set up a new one. And that's why okay. I had tweeted out, hey, we're going to be streaming live. And right. Uh, now we have an updated link. So cool. And I tried to spread that this morning as well. You so, did, yes, uh, you did. Now the only thing that's confusing me now about our technical setup is I see two different chat rooms. So there's one on our YouTube page, Sweet. and there's one on our Google Hangout page. So I guess people can chat with us however they like, and we will relay 
will run across the room and and spread the word. Right, exactly. So so next time we do this, we may try using Twitch or something else. Um, you know, maybe I'll get all that software set up and if our fans like it, then we'll keep doing it. Hey, why wouldn't they? Of course. Of course. <laughs> well, they really come here to see you, Scott. So uh, I doubt that. Uh, you, you're the you're the uh, the main face now. You're doing the the weekly thing, which I have to say I think is awesome that you uh, <laughs> spend that time uh, doing the research. It's got to take like four or five times the amount of time at least that you spend broadcasting, right? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean it's it, it is a labor of love. So we uh, <laughs> we keep it going. I keep it going and. Uh, like I've mentioned maybe on the on the show before, the hardest part about it is trying to narrow down the top three topics from the week because there's right. some weeks that there's so much going on and you just it's hard to choose. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know the feeling, but uh, I, I do appreciate it. I think everybody else does too. It's nice to get a weekly uh, sort of uh, start start to your week on Monday mornings, listen to the the latest security news on the shared security weekly blaze and yeah so uh, and we do thank our sponsors uh, who've helped us along so far and we look, look forward to working with them in the future so all that to say let's uh let's get started what are we going to talk about today on this episode of great content yeah i wanted to uh mention just a couple of the big topics and you know i mentioned a few of these on the weekly blaze but maybe we can dig into them a little bit more um one is the the massive apple facetime bug right that yeah i think everyone should know about um so we can talk a little bit about that and how fun that vulnerability is um i think it's really interesting so, yeah, I mean, it's not, I guess it's not still fully uh, accessible or exploitable uh, as far as no. we know, but uh, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that. Do you want to go into that right away or do you want to talk about the other uh, topics? Yeah, let's just, let's go right into it. I think sure. that'd be good. Okay. So yeah, the, the Apple FaceTime thing, ironically, I think, did it not get exposed on uh, data privacy day? <laughs> yes, it did, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> It was that so Monday. That was, right? was well-planned. Um, it was. Uh, but so uh, how did it go? The story was a, a teenager sort of accidentally discovered this? Yeah, a teenager was playing Fortnite with his friends and 14-year-old, and he wanted to group FaceTime, I guess, his uh, teammates when he was playing Fortnite and just kind of accidentally discovered the bug that when he tried to, he accidentally added himself to the... Uh, a group chat and he found that he could listen in on his friend's conversations even though his friend didn't even pick up the the facetime call but but he could see and hear them right or right. he could hear them at least i can't i'm not sure yes. if it, were, it was just video or just audio you can do it, and or... video too yeah oh, it was video too wow. So uh, his mother happened to be a lawyer and went down just a bunch of different rabbit holes trying to get in front of Apple. You know, they called Apple support. Apple support was like, we don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> they even tried contacting like, I guess, Fox News and, you know, major, you know, uh, news publications mm -hmm. and things. And no one was doing anything till finally, um, I believe the reporter from uh, Mac Nine to Five, which is the uh, what was it? Yeah, Nine to Five Mac, uh, picked up the story, and then Apple finally heard about it, and then got involved from that point. Right. So it's interesting, right? I mean, we've talked a few times before about sort of the convention within the security community that we call yeah. responsible disclosure, and we know that there are always good guys trying to hack. Uh, products so that, you know, if we find a vulnerability, we would share it with uh, a company or a vendor. And uh, so they'd have a chance to fix it before anybody actually <laughs> is able to exploit it. Um, and so in the security community, we really kind of understand, you know, you'd be looking for their responsible disclosure statement somewhere and how do you contact them? And I'm sure Apple has one, but it's kind of interesting and funny that, you know, a business can't really expect that everybody's going to use that process if they don't know about it, right? That's right. Uh, so... So there's, and next thing you know, <laughs> it's in the news. So that's, that's not right. ideal, but uh, it, it is uh, what happens. Yep. And uh, and here's kind of the the webpage 
Um, oh, cool. I assume everyone can see that, but and we'll yes. have this linked in the show notes if you're interested in, in more details. But essentially what Apple did was they disabled the group FaceTime functionality as a temporary fix until they actually release an update to iOS. Um, right. And Mac OS. So, and, yeah, that's a good point. So it, it's, I mean, it, it's a FaceTime vulnerability, but it's not like everybody that uses FaceTime, uh, I guess is, well, I guess they would have been, if, uh, the way it, I understand the attack work is you don't have to, uh, have consented to be part of a group, right? Um, right. It would be the caller that tries to create a group while they're calling you or tries to add yes. a, a, a new, uh, phone number. And as soon as they add that phone number in, uh, it creates that uh, open mic or open <laughs> uh, connection uh, without the receiver of the call knowing that's going on. So it is kind of scary. So it's a good thing that they did disable uh, group chat and, uh, uh, right away, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it goes back into, you know, it's kind of surprising that Apple didn't catch this in their you know, QA process or in through their security testing when they release a new update or a new operating system. Um, I mean, if a 14 year old can find it, <laughs> uh, you know, and, yeah. and it, you know, the other piece of this too, it's a little concerning that when they called Apple support uh, to kind of report this issue, no one at Apple directed them to actually submit this through the proper channel at Apple, yeah. which is an email to security at apple.com. Right. which is used by, you know, their bug bounty program and probably their sure. security team. Yeah. And it should be really easy to find, right? It should be as, as easy to find as the yeah. breach notifications, right? When, when you have a yeah. security breach. So, yeah. so, you know, hopefully a lesson learned for Apple and, you know, and right. for bug disclosure too, because yeah. um, this will most likely happen again. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, it's a, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. Maybe we'll see other uh, companies either learn from this or not learn from it. <laughs> yeah. As as your products and services become uh, more complicated, and uh, you know these kinds of things could creep in, right? That's but it's right. a good good lesson to learn that you really need to test your software for all potential abuses or vulnerabilities, even accidental. So yes, that is yeah. right. Yeah, great story. Um, it is. Good, it is good to. Good to raise awareness about. Cool. So uh, what else is in the news, Tom, that we want to talk about? So did you hear about the the hacker that broke into a Nest camera and started sending obscenities towards the family and saying things like, I can see your baby and I'm going to steal your baby? Oh, boy. Yeah, no, I did. <laughs> I think well, I might have seen a headline about a Nest vulnerability or some Nest incident, but I didn't realize it was uh, that creepy. Yeah, a little creepy. Um, I only pull up the article here. But uh, yeah, so essentially what ended up happening was um, it wasn't a breach at Nest at all. In fact, what it was is uh, password breaches, right? Data breaches. Yeah. There are yep. usernames and passwords from all of these breaches in the past that can easily be obtained. I mean, you don't even have to go on the dark web to find these things. You could just do yeah. some Google searching and you'll come up with, you know, these databases that anybody mm -hmm. can access. And all it takes is, you know, someone writing a script to go through all of those username and password combinations until yeah. one works. Yep. And that's yep. exactly what happened here. Um, you know, probably a very weak password uh, was set for this person's account and it was compromised because guess what? You can access all of these IOT devices and cameras from the internet. So from a web page, you go to nest.com and you just log in with an account. Right. Would this have been detectable by Shodan? No, because uh, the camera itself was not uh, discoverable on the internet. So okay. you're not actually logging into the camera itself. You're logging into nest oh, the account right yes okay. yeah. and then nest is actually then connecting to your camera through their web interface interesting okay that's a good distinction to know about yeah and so what's interesting about it and as i mentioned in the weekly blaze we talked about you know how do you prevent an attack like this well it all starts with password management 
<laughs> is the big thing, right? Yep. Uh, making sure you're using long, complex, unique passwords for every site. Don't use, don't reuse the same password for different sites and services. And of course, try to enable two-factor authentication if it's available. So right. that's something you can't control. Um, so the service has to have that. So Nest does offer a two-factor authentication. And right. that's one of the things that they, um, you know, are saying to do as an extra step to sure. protect your account. And it should be pretty well integrated with Google Authenticator, I would think. So, or you can certainly set it up with Google Authenticator. Um, you know, I don't think that is available yet. They have it through text-based two-factor oh, auth. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, maybe that's something we should talk about briefly, right? So text-based two-factor authentication is is not really a, something that security people recommend using anymore. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure if I could explain the reason why, but uh, would you Give happen to... <laughs> <laughs> You're... Uh, I would just say, I guess there have been uh, proven attacks on uh, yes. SMS uh, messaging uh, where uh, somebody who really wanted to could probably intercept your uh, your message, your PIN message that's coming from the provider and uh, impersonate you in a number of ways, I guess. Uh, but yeah, yep. the Google Authenticator apps and other apps that um, they use a, an API, they use special encrypted messaging. Uh, so that's not uh, possible. So you, that's why you see Google Authenticator as uh, becoming more common. Yep, that's that's exactly right. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing more companies slowly start to move away from SMS-based two-factor auth, not only because of the interception piece, but um, it's just an outdated technology already. Right. <laughs> yeah. It seems like we just yeah. started doing this, but... It, there's better ways of doing two-factor off now. Right, right. Good. Yeah, so I think that was a, a good lesson learned as well. Yep, exactly. And now a word from our sponsor, Edgewise Networks. Organizations' internal networks are overly permissive and can't distinguish trusted from untrusted applications. Attackers abuse this condition to move laterally through networks, bypassing address-based controls to spread malware. Edgewise abstracts security policies away from traditional network controls that rely on IP addresses, ports, and protocols, and instead ties controls directly to applications and their data paths. Edgewise allows organizations to analyze the network attack surface and segment workloads based on the software and how it's communicating. Edgewise monitors applications and protects data paths using zero trust segmentation. Visit edgewise.net to get your free month of visibility. So uh, I think we've, we've had some discussions or at least um, people have asked a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence and, and security. We've, we've talked a little bit in the past about things like machine learning, um, but maybe it's a good time to kind of revisit. Uh, there, I think maybe were a couple of stories about AI in the news recently. So why don't we uh, do a little bit of uh, discussion around uh, AI and cybersecurity? Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to bring it up because I just hear, and maybe it's because we're getting close to the RSA conference that takes place, I believe it's next week um, in San Francisco, which is, they say it's the biggest cybersecurity conference maybe in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been getting a lot of these vendor pitches in my email uh, that say, you know, they're touting their new AI and machine learning technology as you know the greatest thing since sliced bread right yeah. um and you should buy their product because we're using ai it's, um, yeah it's the latest buzzword right and <laughs> if they have an algorithm they could call it ai that's right and i, I started seeing uh, some articles come out just recently about how much money that um is being spent on ai systems and um, all of this technology, and they're predicting that you know seventy-seven point six billion dollars um, mm -hmm. in twenty twenty-two, um, which is they say three times the twenty-four billion forecast in two thousand eighteen. I mean, right. that's a significant amount of you know time and money that's going to be spent on developing yeah. this technology. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not a big surprise, really. It's probably hard to estimate <laughs> how how quickly it, it will be uh, adopted. But um, when you see, you know, some of the discussions, uh, like uh, the one on the Joe Rogan podcast with uh, Elon Musk, right? Uh, it, oh, this one. Musk is so matter of fact <laughs> about how... Uh, how imminent and you know <laughs> basically elon was talking about how um you know it it's going to be used ai is going to be used against humans right or humans are going mm -hmm. to use it against each other um and you could really apply that to the cybersecurity space right um oh yeah it sounds that, very plausible yeah i mean imagine building a weapon a, you know a cyber weapon right which we yeah, I think it's already been done, <laughs> right? Um, you know, nation states have these tools and they're all leveraging AI in some basic form. So it's only natural that this is going to happen where um, yeah. it's going to be taken to a whole new level. It's going to be an arms race, right? So, I mean, just like yeah. all other sort of abusive uh, technologies <laughs> has been more or less done, right? Uh, anything right. new gets... Uh, Anything that can be used for good can also be used for evil and usually is. So uh, maybe yep. sad to say, but that's right. <laughs> right. And I thought it was interesting too, just some of the things I've been reading lately is that guess what AI is programmed or who programs AI? Humans do, right? And so mm -hmm. we have a lot of power to make these, you know, make this machine learning and this technology how we want it to work. So if we want to build in fail safes and, you know, other things. So we don't end up like, uh, you know, Skynet from the Terminator movies. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, yep. seriously, like we should have that control. Um, yeah. But are we thinking about those things now? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's true. And I, actually I think it's on a couple of different levels, right? So the one is there's the, there are the programmers who are creating the code that does the learning and you know the analysis of the data that's collected but then there's the training right that uh, when we say machine learning it means there, there's feedback coming in to tell uh, the system whether it gets right or not and then it adjusts it and refines itself so all of the inputs that come uh into the system are affected by like the biases of of the people who are responding right so right if, if it's uh and i, I heard this I think in some of the discussions uh, in the U.S. politics, right, there is discussions about that, uh, about how the technology and AI is actually being biased by society's biases. So it's not totally reliable or objective. Yeah, that's right. So Nothing we, we shall can do see. <laughs> no, but... Uh, you know, vendors are going to tout this and, you know, whether or not it's what we would consider snake oil. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of good products out there, but we have to keep in mind that this technology is also in its infancy still and has a, has a long way to go. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I thought of a couple of things I wanted to ask you about this, uh, Tom, just from the point of view of security. Um, have you seen any AI systems that uh, you would say are not very secure or not very well thought out? Like, have we seen uh, evidence or examples? Uh, besides from the Terminator movies, uh, <laughs> um, I, there have been examples, I'm sure of it. Um, you know, I, there's one particular, I'd say, endpoint vendor that takes a lot of heat um, about their touts of AI being the end all be all, um, to their product and mm -hmm. how, you know, hackers can't get in and, you know, exploit their product or uh, can't exploit a system that has their product installed. And there's been people in my industry that have broken, you know, their product, and, mm -hmm. you know, they take it back to them and they try to dispute what yeah. these professionals are finding so nothing is unbreakable ai yeah. or I mean, not it happens over and over again right you know you make a claim like that and you know you're just yeah. asking for, yeah. <laughs> for i mean remember remember oracle um many years ago said that they they had this whole campaign that they were unbreakable and yeah. then uh at black hat that one year um uh the one guy i can't remember his name but completely 
broke into like every type of Oracle uh, database and Protocol. bypassing all yeah. their security controls. Um, yeah. it, you know, is he the guy that got uh, scolded by the executive at Oracle for violating the yes. license agreement? Okay. Yes, I believe that was the one. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Just don't do silly. that. Don't don't say your yeah. products are unbreakable. Somebody will break yeah. them. Guaranteed. Yeah. So from the point of view of businesses that might want to, you know, leverage AI or make use of it, you know, I guess a few practical things is, you know, how practical is it to use AI now uh, if you're a business uh, or is it something that you just sort of expect will start to come in the products that you're using? Well, I think there's obviously opportunities for things like machine learning. Um, you know, that's part of AI and that's already being used today. I think machine learning is actually very important because it automates a lot of things that I don't think, you know, were able to be automated before, especially from a right. developer perspective. So, um, you know, there's lots of different use cases for it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just how is it being used and how is it being used responsibly? Um, right. Is the challenge. Right. Are there any particular security concerns or is it more just how, how it can be abused? Um, I, I think the biggest thing is like any any vulnerability that can be found in any system, um, it's code. It gets back to there's still code yeah. that has to be developed by a human. Mm -hmm. And when you're programming machine learning and, and, and those things, humans are going to make mistakes and there's going to be bugs and vulnerabilities right. in the products. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So it, I don't think it's much different than traditional mm -hmm. application vulnerabilities. Right. I was just trying to think of, you know, what, what are the sort of threat model things that you'd be worried most about? And I guess in AI, one of the inherent things is it needs a lot of data, right? So you get a lot of raw data. Um, and if there's a lot of raw data available and an attacker can break in, you know, what can he access or she? Um, you know, if it's all attributed or, you know, uh, linked to people's identities, it could could be a really easy way to, to attack people. Um, so there's the sort of de-identification challenge, right? That uh, how do you protect people's privacy when systems right. are using uh, a lot of data? So that's more of a design or architecture issue uh, with respect to the companies building the AI uh, products. <laughs> I was going to say one of the yeah. uh, pet peeves that I have, I, I don't know if I mentioned it in a previous podcast, but I've gone to a couple of conferences now where I've heard um, people referring to it as the AI, right? As, as if it's like a, <laughs> a little AI. box sitting on your table, you know? So it's uh, kind of weird. And, and I heard it in multiple sessions. So it's like becoming huh. a, a convention uh, that people are using. So that's one of those things that's just going to bug me, I guess, for a while. <laughs> it's the buzzword. I think, every, yeah. like I said, every email I get from a vendor says AI in it. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, buzzword bingo yeah exactly <laughs> and i think a lot of times we associate uh ai with robotics right i guess that yeah there's probably some natural synergy there because you know if you look at uh manufacturing plants that are using robots right they they can do extremely precise and and fast movement and so i guess if if you can make use of the data um in that context uh you know you can sort of really accelerate uh production for example So I uh, was just trying to think of other use cases that um, we might have seen uh, AI used in, and, and then you can think about how the how that affects the security, right? So there's uh, some of the ones that I saw were uh, things like pharmaceutical research. So mm -hmm. you know, they're trying to do predictions or guesses at what kinds of uh, molecular compositions, I guess, would make for good drugs. And you know, obviously, if you could go in and uh, exploit that information or knowledge, then you know, it could do some damage uh, with within the drug system. Um, I think we've, we've seen a lot of AI used in things like uh, product recommendations, right? When you're mm -hmm. looking at uh, Amazon or Netflix, all of the uh, recommendations you get are, are kind of based on your, vi your viewing history as well as the history of other uh, viewers, right? Or other people yep. in the audience. So... I mean, I'm not sure that there's a lot of security issues there. I guess there's privacy from the point of view of, you know, what happens if, you know, information about your viewing habits gets exposed to people you don't want it to, then you know, there could be risks there. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot of it used for things like fraud detection by banks. 
Um, they're trying to look for anomalies or abnormalities in transactions so they can zero in on things and reduce costs. So like you said, it, it's going to be a you know widespread, highly used kind of technology. Uh, but I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, every use case or every place where it's used, it, it has different kinds of risks that you have to kind of look at from different points of view. So that's, that's kind of the stuff that I've <laughs> been trained to do these days. Yeah. Is there going to be any AI in click armor? <laughs> oh, there will be. Yeah. For uh, yeah. when we get to the point of uh, having 3d uh, characters moving around, you know, you maybe having people approach you based on uh, things you've done in the past. So uh, <laughs> nice. it's a, uh, it's a little way in the future, uh, but yeah, click armor is uh, it's coming along. We're going to be commercial in a month or two. So uh, exciting. Uh, yeah. So we'll have more to talk about in a few weeks on that. It's, uh, some exciting announcements. Great. Um, and aside from that, um, I don't know that we have uh, much more to talk about. I'm sure there's always lots to talk about in uh, in security. Did you uh, did you say you had a game or something or a contest? What was your? Oh, I was thinking about it. I didn't have time to do yeah. it for this show. But if we if this works well, then I think one one thing I would like to do is uh, when we get uh, a number of people uh, viewing live, uh, we can do some kind of a competition and have people actually uh, you know use an app to enter responses to questions that I would put on the screen and then we could have a little leaderboard and uh, make a, make a bit of a, a game out of the whole podcast. If, cool. If that seems like people, something people would like to do. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. And I think there may be some things if we start using Twitch, there are some interesting things you can do with that because that's more of a, you know, it's like the streaming platform. Yeah. So yeah. we'll, we'll see, you know, the next one we do, um, maybe we'll be on Twitch and maybe sure. there'll be some ways we can better do contents, contests and yeah, quizzes and things. So for sure. So we'd like to hear from people about, uh, anybody who watched this live, uh, what they thought of it. Uh, <laughs> um, if there's any comments or suggestions that, uh, we can make, uh, use of in our next uh, episode. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I know the time can be, it, it's tough to do these things. It's like webinars because yeah. um, you have to think about West coast, East coast overseas. Yeah. And it's so, you know, any feedback on the time, if this was a good time, bad time, uh, definitely sure. give us that feedback and we can adjust as necessary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we can, we can take your uh, comments under advisement. <laughs> That's right. And, Try and make it the best quality and value for everybody. Great. So uh, I think that's uh, probably all we're going to cover today. And uh, we will try and do this again, hopefully in less than a month or in a month. We will let people know on our social media channels. Yep. Uh, feedback at sharedsecurity.net. You can always contact us through email. And we are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, actually, Instagram, we're... Our, I think over 900 followers now on Instagram. Ooh. That's pretty awesome. Nice. So yeah, that's uh, cool. if you are on Instagram, check it out. I'm always posting a bunch of multimedia um, snippets from the podcast. Um, so yeah, check it out. Excellent. All right. Well, I guess uh, that's a wrap and uh, we will be signing off. But uh, thanks, Tom. And thanks everybody for watching.